Hello, this is uh, Joseph Holbrook, uh, professor of history in Miami at Florida International University. And today we're going to be talking about Latin American history. And we're starting back near the beginning. So today we're going to talk about the encounter, uh, the, the famous encounter. So this is uh, week four of LAH 2020. We're using a textbook by John C. Chastine called Born in Blood and Fire. Um, so, the indigenous people inhabited almost every inch of the Americas. And um, the Europeans called the Western Hemisphere the Americas or America. It was considered to be a fourth continent in addition to Europe, Asia, and Africa, which were often conceptualized as a cross with, you know, with the, uh, based on the story of Noah and his three sons, one went to Europe, one went to Africa, and one went to Asia. That was the uh, biblical medieval uh, conception of the three continents of the world. So as you can imagine, when they discovered the fourth continent and named it America, it uh, caused some consternation. I'm got, having to get organized here. Hang on a second. So uh, this is a picture of a Mayan, a Mayan pic, uh, work of art in uh, something called glyphs. Mayans, of course, inhabited uh, the Pacific coast of South America. And here we have a picture of Tenochtitlan, which was the uh, capital of uh, the Aztec Empire in central Mexico. And my technology is more advanced than I can handle here. So uh, a quote from one of the... Uh, Conquistadores, when they crossed over the mountains and saw Tenochtitlan, was we were astonished and said these things appeared to be enchantments from a book of chivalry, wrote uh, Bartholomew Diaz, uh, describing the Spaniards' first sight of Tenochtitlan. So, uh, as we talk about this, we are talking about uh, empires would be include the Aztec Empire and the Inca Empire, but not the Mayans. The Mayans actually did not have an empire. They uh, would be described more effectively as a civilization. The Maya lived in southern Mexico and Guatemala. They had been very advanced in many ways technologically around 800 AD, uh, but they did not develop a centralized capital or centralized uh, form of government over an empire. Empires tend to be very centralized forms of state government uh, made up of multiple nations with a variety of languages. And uh, so the Maya were not a nation, they were a civilization. You could compare them to the uh, Greek city-states before Alexander the Great. So the rulers of the Aztec Empire were called the Mexicas. That was their tribal name, the Mexica, from which we get the modern name Mexico. The warlike Mexicas were newcomers in the uh, fertile valley of central Mexico. They built their amazing city, that, as I showed you just a moment ago, Tenochtitlan, in the shadow of great volcanoes. They inherited a civilization that had developed in Mexico's central valley over a thousand years. For example, the Pyramid of the Sun, which you can easily visit just outside of, about 45 minutes outside of Mexico City, uh, has the largest pyramid on Earth. It was built long before the Mexicas arrived. In the early 1400s, the Mexicas were the only one among many groups who spoke Nahuatl, the common language of city-states in the region. But they conquered much of central Mexico during the next hundred years. Uh, also, uh, I have a picture of a of a wall. Uh, there's the picture of the Pyramid of the Sun in Tenochtitlan. That's a uh, 
mock-up there around 1998 with my daughter as part of her graduation gift. The Inca capital was called Cusco, meaning the navel of the universe. Today one speaks of the Incas, but the name Inca actually referred only to the emperor and to his empire. Ethnically, the people of Cusco were Quechua speakers, and they too drew on a long history of previous cultural evolution in the Andes. By the way, we offer classes in Quechua at the Latin American and Caribbean Center on uh, the FIU uh, main campus, in case anyone is interested in learning Quechua. So those were the two main empires uh, that uh, the Europeans confronted. Uh, when they arrived in Hispaniola and Cuba, there were no empires. There were simply uh, 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 villages of Taino Indians or Arawak Indians, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So uh, there were four empires in this story, two American empires. By American, I mean First Nations or indigenous peoples that is the Aztecs and the Incas. I talked a little bit about the Incas last week, and two European empires, the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire. And here is, let's see if we can move around here without getting too distracted. And here is a uh, map, a global map, which shows the Western and Eastern hemispheres and it shows uh, the location of the Aztec Empire up in New Spain or modern Mexico, and the uh, Incan Empire along the Pacific coast of South America. And then over in Europe, you see in the Iberian Peninsula, there is Spain and Portugal. For a number of historical reasons, they were the first, particularly Portugal, was the first to venture out into the Atlantic looking for a sea route to the uh to the east because the uh the uh, silk road had been closed off by the ottoman turks that who had taken over control from the uh previous administration i'm drawing a blank right now the mongols i think it was who had controlled the silk road and they were basically religious pluralists but the ottoman turks were were Sunni Muslim, and they were not about to let Christian powers uh, travel along the Silk Road. So Portugal began seeking a route to India, an alternate route. Uh, by venturing out into the Atlantic, they had developed, made some recent developments in navigation techniques and their sailing technology that allowed them to have confidence to venture out in the Atlantic, and they traveled down the coast, the west coast of Africa, setting up trading posts and uh, you can see over there in the bottom left the portuguese colonies that were created along the coast of africa eventually reaching to luanda in the uh, the current capital of angola which was their probably most enduring trading post and in in columbus's voyage was in 1492 just before that, you had Bartholomew Diaz, a uh, Portuguese uh, uh, a sailor, navigator in 1488. John Cabot, who was actually Portuguese, I believe, but he sailed for the British in 1497, exploring the, uh, looking for a northern route through uh, Canada to what is modern Canada to uh, the Indias. Vasco da Gama finally. Uh, passes around the uh, Horn of Africa, and uh, that is in 1497 to 1499. Then Amerigo Vespucci, sailing along the coast of Brazil, makes a sudden uh, sudden awareness, comes to the sudden, sudden awareness that what he's seeing on the coast of Brazil is not an island, but a, a continent. And he names it for his last, with his name, Amerigo. Uh, but he Latinizes it so it rhymes with Eurasia, Africa, Europa, and calls it Americas. 
uh, in Latin. And so that's the new fourth continent. And there's a whole story of how the fourth continent ended up becoming the fourth and fifth continent. And, and it got divided into North and South America. We'll save that for another day. Pedro Alvarez, Alvarez Cabral was on his way to India, and he sailed a little bit too far to the west, according to the story, and ran into Brazil. Uh, very fortunately, because the Pope had divided the uh, world between Spain and Portugal, just so that the very eastern coast of Brazil would land in the Portuguese domains. And some people suspect that Cabral actually, that Portugal actually knew about Brazil, and this was a pretext to plant the Portuguese flag on the uh, west coast of South America, but uh, who knows? Uh, there's no solid historical data. In any case, in 1500, the uh, Brazil was discovered by Portugal. Hernan Cortes conquered the uh, Aztec Empire in 1519, I believe, 1518. Magellan rounded the world in 1424. Pizarro made it down to Peru, and through an amazing series of uh, happenstances, conquers one of the greatest and mightiest and most extensive empires in world history, the Incan Empire. And then you have uh, Jacques Carrier in 1534, up in uh, a Frenchman up in Canada. So that is a brief overview of the expansion of Europeans out globally as it pressed, it uh, pointed forward to the age of colonialism. Dios rogando y con el mazo dando. This is a old proverb in Portuguese. I'm sorry, not Portuguese, but Spanish society. And uh, it indicates a crusading mentality. By the way, the picture there is St. James the, the Moor Slayer, um, the Apostle St. James, uh, who is a mythical figure for Spanish folklore. I'm sure that if the actual St. James knew about this or knows about it, he probably has turned over in his grave. Uh, because the, probably the last thing he would want to be known as is the uh, Matamoros, the slayer of Moors, the killer of Africans. But uh, nonetheless, that represents the crusading mentality of the Spanish Catholic, Catholic medieval Catholicism. Uh, had a very militant uh, crusading mentality after 800 years of occupation of Iberian Peninsula by the uh, Moors, which were a, uh, a, a, a ethnic group from Northern Africa that had adopted Islam as their religion and conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula around 799 uh, or 700. Uh, but the, the Spanish developed a mythos of the conquering conquistadores, Spanish Catholic, that blended uh, religion with nationalism, and over an 800-year period gradually fought their way south and reconquered uh, Spain for the glory of God and for the King of Spain. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula had long been uh, subject to invasions and conquests. It had been invaded uh, in order by the Celts, the Car in Carthage, the Romans, the Germans, Moors, over an 800 uh, year period. The Moors actually brought greater scientific and mathematic, agricultural, and other uh, technological advancements and advancements in science and knowledge to Iberia. The Christian kingdoms pushed back and uh, developed a militant and warlike type of Catholicism. Warrior priests often participated in the battle. Castile was the most important leader of the conquest. Portuguese reconquered their territory uh, about 200 years earlier than the Spanish did. So in some ways, the Portuguese Catholics were had chilled out, I might say, over a couple hundred years and were a little bit less militant than the Spanish. At least that's my impression from reading history. Uh, 
there's a lot of uh, deposit or residue of Moorish culture and society in Spanish culture and society. They were uh, good physicians, good engineers, good farmers, better than the Iberian Christians who preceded them. Uh, Spanish gradually filled up with Arabic words, such as basil, artichokes, almonds, new processes and substances such as distillation and alcohol, new furnishings such as carpeting, even new sciences such as algebra and chemistry. And so almost a quarter of modern Spanish and Portuguese is composed of Arabic words, uh, words that have their root in Arabic. Um, Santiago de Compostela is believed to be the burial place of St. James the Apostle. There was an incident uh, in the remote history of Spain around shortly after the conquest of the uh, Muslims, in which in a key battle between Christians and Muslims, they, there was an appearance or a vision, uh, an apparition of a, uh, of a uh, knight on a white horse. It was near Santiago de Compostela, and it was believed to be St. James the Apostle, who in Spanish became Santi, Santiago el Matamoros, St. James the Morslayer, who becomes the patron saint of uh, the uh, Spanish Catholic Church. And this takes us to uh, the ancient provinces of Castile, Aragon, and Granada. Uh, Spain was basically divided up into a number of provinces, including Portugal and uh, Galicia. Uh, but uh, gradually they began to unite. The most important of these provinces was Castile, which is why proper Spanish, at least in some places like Bogota, is called Castilian. Castilian is considered to be the gold standard of proper Spanish. So Castile became the largest province. Its domin uh, dominions eventually engulfed much of Iberia and became united with Aragon, Leon, and Navarre uh, when is Queen is Princess Isabella or Queen Isabella married uh, Prince Ferdinand, and uh, they became uh, that began that was the foundation of modern Spain basically. Portugal led a parallel advance on the southwest of the Iberian Peninsula, maintained complete independence from Spain, and was the first to complete its reconquest in the mid-1200s. On the Spanish side, the Moorish Kingdom of Granada held out for two more centuries, but finally succumbed to the Castilian military power in 1492. This is important. And I think it was in February 1492, Granada fell, and Spain was united at last under a Christian monarchy. And uh, in August of 1492, the same year, Christopher Columbus arrived in the Bahamas in his quest to find a westward route across the Atlantic to India. And so this, of course, has great consequences for the nature of the conquest of the conquest of uh, the Americas and the treatment of the Native Americans. So here you see France in the upper right, and below that is Navarre and Aragon, which includes Valencia and Barcelona. And uh, then in the middle is Castile, a united of several previous provinces, including Galicia. And then on the uh, westward side or the left is Portugal. And in the very much southernmost part, you have Granada as the capital of, uh, of the province of Granada. And then across, of course, the Mediterranean is North Africa. So this uh, means that the Reconquista in the Iberian Peninsula quickly translated and moved into high gear in the Conquista. Queen Isabel was a Catholic monarch and was committed to spreading Catholicism. Catholic monarchies 
purged non-Catholics very quickly, almost immediately after conquering Granada, uh, first Muslims and then later Jews were forced to convert or immigrate from Iberia. And uh, they were, in other words, they had to become Catholics or they had to leave. A lot of Jews went to Portugal and then later on to Brazil. And so this was going on uh, shortly, just barely, uh, I blink, before the Protestant Reformation. This uh, conquest of Granada was 1492. And in 1521, uh, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door. And the uh, Protestant Reformation was on, which only added fuel to the militancy and fire of the Catholic conquest in the Americas because they were losing ground in Europe and they, uh, had the, they, they had the thought that they could make it up in the Americas. So the Reformations, uh, the Reformation brought about a great deal of violence in Europe. Catholics and Protestants fought throughout Europe for over a century. At the same time, the Reconquista shifted gears and pivoted into a conquista in the American hemisphere. And then we should talk briefly about Brazil, which was a slightly different situation. So in 1500, Pedro Alvarez Cabral was sailing with a fleet of ships, Portuguese ships, to India. And you can see his route there, which veers pretty far west out into the Atlantic. But notice how close the the eastern tip of Brazil is to the western western part of Africa. It's not that far apart. And so, uh, I mean, it's less than half of the distance that Columbus sailed to get to the Bahamas. So he veered a little bit too far west and discovered uh, the landmass of Brazil and planted a cross there, the land of the True Cross, and claimed it for Portugal, which was very convenient because the uh, line of Tordesillas was basically right about here leaving a slice of eastern Brazil available for Portuguese colonization. So they first named it the Island of the True Cross, not quite realizing that it was not an island, that it was a, uh, it was a continent. And so the Portuguese didn't, have, uh, didn't initially value this territory very much. They were more interested in trade and free trade and mercantilism, and their trading posts along the coast of Africa, and eventually in India and a number of other places in Asia were seen as far more valuable and profitable. They were interested in access to spices, silk, gold, and silver. That occupied their attention, and there didn't seem to be anything of value in Brazil. Eventually, they found this uh, interesting uh, tree that called a Brazil wood tree, that they were able to make red dye from that had value in Europe. And so the Brazil wood tree gave its name to the future country of Brazil. There was also some small scale trade between the Portuguese and the, the native Tupi Indians uh, that they were, um, at a, they were at a less complex and advanced stage of development than the Incas and Aztecs. Mostly uh, they were, Set into uh, semi sedentary communities without a lot of uh, resources for the Portuguese to exploit. And this leads, uh, but eventually uh, the Portuguese begin to. Uh, let me find my spot here. Right here is where we were. So eventually, uh, the Portuguese begin to become concerned about Brazil because the French arrive in the Bay of Guanabara, which is uh, where modern-day Rio de Janeiro is located. Uh, these French were mostly Huguenots, uh, Calvinist Frenchmen, not Catholic. And they were trying to find some place in the New World, quote-unquote, that they could practice their religion and descend from the Catholicism of France similar to what the Puritans and the Pilgrims were doing in Massachusetts. Uh, 
So they set up shop in the future location of Rio de Janeiro, and this alarmed the Portuguese throne. So the king began to assert a claim to the territory. Uh, they began, they divided up uh, the land mass of the coast of Brazil into captaincies. And they began to plant sugarcane, especially in the northeast in Bahia. The Tupi used the terrain to attack and flee into the forest. They were not very um, amendable to the idea of being forced into slave labor in sugarcane production. So, uh, nevertheless, many of the Tupis were conquered and were forced into slavery and forced to work in producing, uh, mass producing sugar cane, which was the new up and coming commodity that, uh, had a lot of potential for wealth. There were a number of indigenous rebellions that threatened to destroy the settlements up through the 1540s. The first capital was in Salvador de Bahia with a royal governor. Let me uh, go back here to, here we go. So Salvador de Bahia would be right here. Later on, Rio de Janeiro is gonna be down here. Uh, so these are the captaincies, as you see there, the uh, east-west slices or rectangles. The idea of the king was to allow these wealthy Portuguese owners called captaincies or captains to finance their own colonization project as the Portuguese royal court did not have the, the capital resources to do that. And uh, disease was a major problem, especially for the indigenous communities who had no immunities to European diseases. The same story that you see in Hisp Hispaniola, Cuba, later in, in Central Mexico and in Peru, uh, the Indians died off in massive numbers due to their at lack of immunities. Uh, Jesuit priests soon began to arrive, not in 1534, but more in the 1560s, Jesuits began to arrive and did their for the most part, did their level best to defend the indigenous people from enslavement. An important detail here is that uh, thanks to Bartolomé de las Casas, uh, you had legislation early on in Spain in 1512, the laws of Burgos, and then later the new laws in 1542, I think it was, that attempted to curb abuses against Native Americans and Spanish law forbade the enslavement of Indians. When you watch the movie, The Mission, you'll see that that was not always observed, that the, the slaving, enslaving of Indians went on under the table. Nevertheless, the Spanish had laws forbidding the slavery of Indians, which the Portuguese did not. There was no Portuguese uh, Bartolome de las Casas until much later. And we'll talk about him. Okay, so lost my spot here. Most of the captaincies failed. The most successful were those who were able to minimize conflict with the Indians. Pernambuco did pretty good. It set up uh, up in the northeastern tip of Brazil. It set up a model sugar captaincy. It, de it developed and exported sugar. The captain of that captaincy established an alliance by marriage with the local chief, so he's able to make peace. Nonetheless, most of the others failed for lack of capital or because of conflict with uh, indigenous people. Uh, on the Bay of, in the Bay of All Saints, the Tupi Namba, Tupi Namba, a subgroup of the Tupi, demolished one of the most promising settlements by 1548. The Portuguese king stepped up the colonization of Brazil by appointing a royal governor in the capital city of Salvador de Bahia. I don't know if this is in my notes, but a funny story. It's not really funny if you're if you're the uh, bishop, but the first bishop sent to to Portugal. I'm sorry, to Brazil uh, was captured. <laughs> 
and eaten by by uh, cannibals in Brazil. Had him over for dinner. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that. Uh, the Jesuits are kind of happy because they didn't really like him. He was he was not from a Jesuit background. He was not very supportive of the Jesuit cause in Brazil, so they did not weep for him. So over the next half a century, the Tupi Namba vanished from the area of the sugar plantations. European diseases were partly to blame. Uh, abuse of treatment and slavery was another part of the blame. Uh, gatherings of native populations facilitated the cast catastrophe. Uh, even the Jesuits uh, inadvertently furthered their demise by trying to gather the the uh, Tupinamba into uh, reducciones or um, uh, villages, communities, in an attempt to protect them, not realizing that that would expose them more to European diseases. And so. Um, to good intentions or bad, the uh, indigenous people were decimated. So this brings us to the African slave trade, uh, which is a terrible and depressing topic, as well as the destruction of the indigenous people. This is where John Chastine uses the term born in blood and fire. And he's referring to both the genocide, although the, I'm using that word rather loosely, but the uh, Holocaust of indigenous peoples, as well as the four centuries of the horrible African slave trade. And let me go back to my pictures here. I have another picture for you. There we go. So this is a picture of the slave trade of forced uh, forced transportation of African slave labor from Africa to the New World, quote unquote, and you see that a, a large, the largest number went to Brazil, uh, and they were engaged in the uh, pr mass production of sugar. The next largest number went to the uh, Caribbean, particularly Cuba, but also San Dominique, which is modern day Haiti and Jamaica, Barbados, Cartagena, a smaller number. From Cartagena, many slaves were sold and uh, transported across to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and then a, a significant number were transported to the southern states of the English colonies in North America, about a half a million to the modern United States or the southern states, southern English colonies. Uh, about four million to Brazil, and I think about a million and a half to the Caribbean. Now that doesn't include the number of people who died, uh, which is probably nearly the same as those who survived crossing the Atlantic. So the idea here was that the indigenous populations, of course, they collapsed. They didn't have immunities. They uh, they weren't. Uh, culturally accustomed to the kind of work that the Europeans demanded. And so pretty soon there was a huge labor shortage, especially in order to create wealth. And the Africans had had a millennia to uh, build up resistance to European diseases. And they had the immunities. They also were accustomed to farm work and and hard labor and so they began to be they began to be uh, replace the indigenous slavery also in the spanish territories the indigenous slavery was forbidden this encounter brought together people from three continents from the, uh, europe from uh, africa and from the american the Americas, the indigenous people of the Americas, which you could say by extension had a lot of uh, genetic similarity to Asians. So Europeans and Africans had more in common with each other than either of them had with indigenous Americans. Uh, the uh, Americas, the American hemisphere had been isolated from the Eurasian hemisphere for 20,000 years. And so there had been no cultural diffusion, no genetic diffusion, no technological diffusion between the two hemispheres. 
uh, which explains a lot of what happened pretty quickly. And so you see here some of the, there were uh, African slaves in Iberia, in both Spain and Portugal. And so it wasn't an entirely new thing for the Spanish or the Portuguese to utilize African slaves. I'll talk some other time about the history of slavery, but of course the word slave comes from Slav, which are Eastern Europeans. And slavery in the beginning in the Caribbean was not strictly color-based. You had Irish slaves, you had white slaves, indentured servants, uh, criminals, uh, po uh, prostitutes were brought over to the Caribbean as slaves or indentured servants. Uh, it, it only became color-based because of the huge lucrative motivation and the fact that by well that's a long subject i won't get into it but uh there was partly religious religious thinking going on that uh european peoples considered themselves christian and they felt like they should not enslave other christians but then what happens when africans begin to adopt christianity suddenly they're christians so you can no longer use that justification and any, at any rate, the Europeans began importing enslaved Africans, and uh, slavery had already been part of the African societies, although it was an entirely different kind of slavery. But slaves were often war captives. Slavery in Africa was not permanent, nor was it inherited. Your children didn't automatically become slaves. Uh, it was not based on mass production of sugar or cotton. Uh, the expected life, the life expectancy of a African slave newly arrived in Cuba working in the, in the sugar industry was seven years or Brazil, which is ac absolutely appalling. But it was cheaper to work them to death than it was, than it was to, uh, take care of them. It was cheaper to work them to death and buy new slaves. So this brings us down to the indigenous groups, the Spanish invasion. You see it coming through the Caribbean. And from there, it branches off into North America and South America and the Inca Empire and the Aztec Empire and the Portuguese in Brazil. And these are the territories that uh, remained under the influence of Portugal. Angola and Mozambique primarily, although there's a little slice up there on the western uh, protrusion there of Africa. So to, do, to this day, um, Angola and Mozambique both uh, speak Portuguese as their official language. And they became chief sources for the slave trade after the Portuguese had been edged out of West Africa by competition from the Dutch and the English. Here's a uh, picture of Tenochtitlan, and uh, I'm not going to go into the fall of the Aztecs and Incas because I've already discussed that with the Incas, but it's quite a uh, dramatic story if you wish to read up on it. And of course, it had to do with uh, surprise. Sometimes there were some religious overtones. Some of uh, some of the Aztecs may have thought that. Hernan Cortez was a returning god, that Quetzalcoatl, and uh, they were totally unfamiliar with their sailing ships, with horses, with fighting dogs, uh, with steel technology. So the Spanish had a lot of military and technological uh, advantages, but also the Aztecs had been pretty uh, abusive and oppressive with neighboring indigenous groups. That were under their thumb and so there were plenty of indigenous groups that were willing to volunteer to fight alongside Cortez uh, against their uh, ancient enemies the Aztecs so a lot of those things plus the sickness was ravaging the Aztecs they were uh, they, you know the the whole city was sick with smallpox and including a couple of the uh, uh, rulers so that led to their defeat, and that led to the beginning of Spanish colonization and the birth of Spanish America. It's important that you know about the encomienda system, 
We'll talk some more about that, but it was based on a system that was used previously in the Reconquista of Spain against the Moors. Uh, there was a new society emerging in Brazil, a new society emerging in modern Mexico, which was called New Spain at that time. La Melinche, let's see if I have a picture of her. Here it is. La Melinche was a young Aztec woman who had been sold into slavery to the Mayas, so she was fluent in Aztec and Mayan, and she was given to Cor Cortez as a gift to be his mistress. She quickly learned Spanish, or Castilian, as we should say, and she became the translator for Aztec and his expedition. She's been kind of criticized in Mexican culture because of, she was seen as a collaborator. Uh, she had marked Cortez's baby soon after the fall of Tenochtitlan, and then he gave her away to one of his men and married a Spanish bride so he could be in proper society. Tough stuff. She's also known as Malintzen in uh, Nahuatl, or Malinche. And uh, she was not yet 25 when she had her second child to one, to one of uh, Cortez's loyal men. And this leads us to mestizos and mestizaje. This is the mixture of European and indigenous blood and DNA through uh, cross marriage or um, or rape. More often, probably was rape. A lot of uh, indigenous women were taken by Spanish men because there were no women with them. And the children that were born were brown. They weren't fully indigenous. They weren't fully European. And so for a long period of time, mestizos were considered second-class people in Spanish society, actually third-class, because the uh, the Spanish that were born in the Americas were called Creoles, and they were second-class to Peninsulares, those who were born in Iberia. And then your third class was the mestizos, who had no status at all. They were not protected as indigenous people. They were not European. They were not even Creoles. And so the mestizos uh, became a very uh, rapidly growing and poor segment of society in Latin American culture. Um, we could talk a little bit about religious conversions. There was a tremendous haste to convert as many people as possible to the Catholic faith. Remember at this time, uh, the Protestant Reformation was raging in Europe and religious warfare and huge portions of Germany, uh, England eventually, and the Nordic countries broke away from the papacy and from Catholicism. And so Spain sent uh, n numerous missionaries to the New World, including, uh, I think it was in 1518, they sent 12 Franciscan priests or monks who uh, kind of viewed themselves like Jesus and the 12 apostles. And over a period of 20 years, they, some of them claimed to baptize millions of indigenous people. Obviously, they weren't taking the time to learn the language or to teach the, the Indians the Spanish language. They, and they were just basically baptizing them into the, to the, under the God of their conquerors. So in their haste to baptize missionaries, sprinkle holy water on masses of indigenous people in mass ceremonies which did very little to teach Christianity. Among the sedentary peoples, the Spanish made a habit of erecting churches on sites that were already sacred to indigenous deities. A great example is the, is the uh, shrine to the Virgin of Guadalupe, which was built over the shrine of the Aztec goddess Tonitzin, which was the earth, the filth eater on the in the Aztec uh, pantheon. So the encounter had a dire impact on agricultural societies. The Spanish often demanded more tribute than, than they had the indigenous overlords previously. Andean villages provided a labor draft called the Mita to their Inca rulers. But after the conquest, the Mita laborers were forced to toil in shafts of deep shafts of silver mines and were absent from their families and villages for months at a time. And European diseases continued to decimate uh, indigenous society. So this leads to the uh, beginnings of a new 
mestizo society in both the Spanish territories as well as the Portuguese language territories where you have a, a new mestizo race of uh, both of mixed blood of European and indigenous blood and in the Caribbean, European and African, and in the west coast of Brazil, also European and African, and that lays the foundations for a new society. And uh, as John Chastain is fond to point out, the very core of this new society was social injustice. He says the original sin of the Latin American history, the festering social injustice to the core. Let me go back here. Festering social justice at the core had done its durable damage. So he believes that this explains a lot of why Latin American economic and technological development is is behind that of the United States or Great Britain because it was uh, it has the foundational traumas at its core. How would more equitable and more inclusive communities ever emerge from the smoking ruins of conquest? The next step, systematic colonization, the creation of entire social systems geared to serve the interests of distant masters in Europe only made matters worse. So there's some key terms of vocabulary, encounter, pampas, sedentary, semi-sedentary, non-sedentary, Tupi, Tupi Nimba, the Inca Empire, the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, the capital city, the Mayas, and the Iberian and the Iberian Peninsula, the Reconquest, Isabel of Castile, Hernan Cortez, Montezuma, P Francisco Pizarro, and the Ecomienda, and Bartolome de las Casas are all words and pe people that you should remember from this chapter. Um, there's some in your PowerPoint, there's some study questions at the end of the PowerPoint. I would encourage you to read those. And that is all for today. So, I will be back with you next week. I'm in Maryland right now enjoying uh, the early stages of my new marriage and uh, meeting a lot of new people, family and friends. And uh, I'll be back in Miami uh, in a couple months to begin the new semester. I encourage you to uh, read the chapter and uh, reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Take care.